much. Welcome, everybody. We're moving into our next session. So welcome to the session, What Happened to the Dreams, Police Violence and Racism, a memorial to George Floyd. Um, can somebody move me to, like, can I change to speak of you? Yeah, you are ready at the speak of you. OK, now, yes. All right. Um, no, you are Diko, not me. <laughs> well, anyway, um, we are privileged to be joined today by Dr. Essen Nyek and Mr. Reed, both of whom are in New York, and also Efe Paul Azino in Lagos. I'm Tomupe Maposa, and my co-host is Diko Mohammed. We'll give our speakers about 10 min minutes each, then Efe Paul Azino will give a literary sonic response. After that, we'll have a discussion where questions are welcome from everybody. And if there's time, I think we can also add Samania to um, sing for us towards the end. So I'll begin by um, introducing Dr. Nyek. Dr. Sibyl Ngonyek is a recent Bayreuth Academy of Advanced African Studies Fellow who is broadly trained in the international political economy of development, political theory and comparative politics with a focus on Africa. Her research interests focus on gender, sexuality and identity politics emphasizing the LGBTI experience in Africa and the political economy of development. Academically, she comes from the dis discipline of political science, but she is intersectional at the core in her theory and analysis of gender and sexuality, borrowing from fields such as philosophy, anthropology, law, literature, theology, ethics, and film studies. Over to you, Dr. Nyek. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate. Um, <clears throat> the question put to us is, uh, what happened to the dreams? And I like that in that title, there is an S. It's not a dream, but many, uh, many dreams. So as I... Um, gave it some thought. I was drawn to Martin Luther King one more time. Martin Luther King struggle in the 60s by analogy is very similar to uh, what is going on today. We are living in a context of a pandemic, the context in which we are also seeing Black bodies dropping, not because of the virus itself, but because of uh, police violence. In the 60s, I established some similarities here between now and then in the ways in which racial oppression was felt as uh, structurally present and to some extent inevitable. The racial crisis was felt also not abstractly, but intimately, leading King and other civil rights movement leaders to question the significance of the circumstances. At some point in the United States, the Negro was 60% of a, of a person, constitutionally speaking. Economically speaking, King document, he was 50%. The statistics he relied on were staggering in terms of the indifference of public institutions in the 60s. And facing this reality, King said, even the semantics have conspired to make that which is Black seem ugly. And today, 
it is not just a coronavirus and quarantine and alienation. It is racism. It is political violence. So what happened to the dream? I want to return to King and listen to what he said back then. And this is what he said. First, we must massively assert our dignity and worth. We must stand up amidst a system that still oppresses us and develop an unassailable and majestic sense of values. We must no longer be ashamed of being black. The job of arousing manhood within a people that have been taught for so many centuries that they are nobody is not easy. Whatever is it that we are going to do, whichever trajectory we want to give to our dreams and hopes of today, King calls it the job of arousing manhood in the people. Excuse the gendered language here, but I think we know what he understands. The sense of dignity in a people. It is very interesting to me that King, who is a theologian, of course, he uses this very erotic language, arousing something in a people. He didn't say one person, he didn't say one woman, he didn't say one man or child, a people. Elsewhere, King talks about the term agape. Agape means understanding, redeeming the goodwill of all men. It is an overflowing of love, which is purely spontaneous, unmotivated, groundless, and creative. It is not set in motion by any quality or function of its object. So where do we go from here? King sees the dreams as enfolded in this sort of erotic foil. Why eroticism? Because we have to, at some point, understand and accept that if for 400 years and more, we have gone to the moon and back, we have created internet and Zoom and all of these things, we are still talking about race in the 21st century. It means that we cannot theorize ourselves out of that condition. It means that here is the time. The dream is not just one that is abstract. It is one that is inviting us in our flesh, in our body, in our daily experience, on the street, but also in academia, in academia on campus, everywhere to be aroused. Audre Lord will say, eroticism is power. Power, why? Because it tells us something about not power over somebody, but power with somebody. Not power to dominate, but power to relate. To integrate is a better term. So where do we go from here? King wants ask. While well, we stay in the moment, the here and now, we rise up with our fear, whether the peak or a bit. And in so doing, we let go of any ground that comforts anything but the creative energy, the arousing energy of life overcoming death. City death, crazy death, what have you. We are fighting, the dream is the power of life against death. The prescription here is not against fear, we, we, we will fear. It is not even against doubt. We do not know where this 
excitement is going to lead us, whether there will be true and serious change. We do not know. So we're going to hold those things inside us. But the prescription here, it is for love of the self. And if I may use King's own framing, in close, love in close, in God and in God and in God and in the self. And for those who are not familiar with the language, it might just be good to stay with love in close in the soul of the world, in the being of the world. So George Floyd is maintained to the crown, calling for his mama, broad daylight, the police on his neck. It's very comforting for some of us in academia to sit and be shocked. Oh my God. But if we are really about to think about the dreams of today and tomorrow, what is it we are doing to be eroticized for justice in our own context? What are the, 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 the knees in our own context and in whose neck are they resting? He never talked about destruction. His was an ethics that was incarnational. And incarnational just means something that comes inside, embodiment, better term. We got to experience, unless we get to the point where the experience of black bodies, brown bodies, is not a theory. And as, as a theorist, I think we can run with it. It is fun. But we should not be uh, 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 um, uh, sort of cajoling ourselves that that is enough. Try lying on the street in a broad daylight with a neck, a, with, a, with a knee on your neck. Then when you feel that, sit with that experience. I'm going to end with two experiences of mine to show you that this is not about somebody on the street. It is not about anything. It doesn't matter. Racism doesn't care whether you have a PhD or you don't have it. So the dream is cannot be somebody's dream. It has to be dreams, all of us, everywhere we are. So I'm driving from Canada to the United States and I go to, to these small villages and I see a police car coming opposite direction, you know, continue to drive, turns around and follow me all the way out of the, the little village and then stops me. Um, takes my driver's license and uh, says, uh, ma'am, uh, you, you, you were speeding. I said, no, I wasn't. But then what are you going to do? You got a ticket. And I want you to understand, I don't know how Europe works. But this is how it works in the United States. A ticket, traffic ticket is not just something you get and you know you pay and that's it, the transaction is, is, is there. No. You pay it and then it has financial impact because your insurance company now, car insurance company, is going to raise your premium. So just think about it. It is not that you have to commit a crime. In fact, you are a law abiding citizen, but there is this taxation. You are taxed for doing the right thing. This is the land of the free, and this is what we mean by freedom in the United States. So I wanna go back to Martin Luther King and say, what is it that us, my colleagues here and everybody uh, exchanging in this platform, what kind of scholarship are we doing over the past 400 years that is not getting us to that place where we can be aroused and experience, experience, not theorize, experience 
this utopia of humanity in all of us. It would take something beyond theory, I think. It would take more than visions, I think. And I think that uh, the next session will probably have more to say about it. But so far, this is my broad kind of take on um, the question of how we can celebrate the life of uh, George Floyd, uh, but also of all others that are, have been killed before, men and women and children, and who are continuing to be um, killed um, in the United States and elsewhere. So thank you. I hope uh, I didn't go too, uh, too, too far um, from my allocated time. I, I'll, I'll be open for your question and, and take and reactions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nyak. Um, that was interesting about considering humanity as a, as a utopian ideal and how at this moment in history, it actually feels very far away that humans themselves as black people that we're begging to be acknowledged as people who matter. And it is kind of something, you know, I wrote it down, utopian humanity. It's something for us to take with us. Um, I'm not sure, would people like to do questions now or we speak to Mr. Reed first and then we gather the questions. What do you think, Dipo? I was thinking we should have the talks first. If people okay. have questions for uh, Dr. Nier can type, we have them. We can collect from uh, YouTube also so that after the speeches, then all the talks, then we go the questions and then we'll be addressing them as uh, they are put forward to the person. I mean, yeah, I think that's better. All right, so I'll introduce Mr. Reed then. Um, Mr. Reed is a multi-talented performer, musician, lyricist, and actor. Beginning in his hometown of Brooklyn, Mr. Reed humbly performs on the subway platforms of New York City, and he has also taken his talents around the world crossing borders to reach diverse audiences across Europe and in Africa. Mr. Reed has been a prominent featured performer at multiple African diasporic themed events. Mr. Reed, welcome once again to our Big Sis Festival. Over to you. Mr. Reed. <laughs> Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> welcome back. Okay, I'm happy to be here with all of you, of course. And um, the way that I kind of posed uh, this experience was as kind of a back and forth engagement. Um, but taking off from where, um, if I'm correct, Dr. Nye, uh, you know, brought with um, her position I look at the uniqueness, especially of, of my coming from the position of the African-American, right? Where I am expected to immediately identify with George Floyd's condition as something that would immediately affect me through a familiarity of having been raised within the paradigm of American oppression. Right. And that from the age of about four years old, you know, I was if younger from about two years old. I was living in the middle of the crack epidemic in the United States. I was aware of the petite bourgeoisie wealth that was being created by it by young black men, you know, um, selling drugs. But then it's like these young black men didn't have the boats, right? They didn't have the planes. They didn't have uh, the means of manufacture to, to inspire greater manufacture. It was an unseen hand, right? So, from very young, I was groomed almost to 
a level of believing that governmental oppression was equivalent to God, that the government was G-O-V and God was G-O-D, and that at any point that could be manipulated, right? That could be moved around. A cop, a COP could come with the D-O-G, right? A cop could come with their dogs and they could say the dog smelled something. I mean, who am I to trust that a dog knows what is going on in someone's car? But for that reason, they could kill a black man because the dog, the canine, said it was okay. And I, I grew up, I, I've never been a fearful person. Um, my mother was a bishop. I grew up in a spirituality of where the African dynamic of it, whether it was hoodoo or it was a form of vodun, even with Christianity put on top of it, made us aware of spirits. And there's a distinct spirit associated with policing. There was a distinct spirit associated with, again, the power that was over you. And it's interesting to think about because I put it in a space of when we talk about uh, white morality uh, through the through the lens of racism, uh, you get back to like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King talking about um, white culture being morally bankrupt through its actions as a matter of fact, right? As a matter of these are the facts, these are the circumstances. At what point did your belief in God trade from the infinite of God's mercy, of God's kindness, of God's well-being to only the limit, to only the limit of your God's premise of destruction, of leaving people without tangible hope within your system? I mean, as Black people, we have infinite hope within ourselves. So we're quite motivated as human beings. But coming back to George Floyd, I see myself from the age of two being aware of the cat and mouse game of the police versus the so-called criminal. Without necessarily having the context of that there was a government hand supplying the drugs. So when we talk about crime, we're actually looking at a rat race and we hold the rats accountable, but not the scientists setting up the situation. Do you get what I'm saying? And I'm like, okay, so now I've gone from two years old, I've gone to three years old. And what was my first major encounter with the police? I was, um, my mother was a single mother. She went into a check cashing, into a check cashing store. And that was an era where you had what was called latchkey kids. You know, children who, because it was a single parent in the house, the parent had to leave, the kids had to stay in the house, not be seen, Make sure that nobody comes into the house. Take care of your brothers and your sisters. But in this moment, I remember it was the year 1989. And I got out of the car while my brother was asleep. And my brother was maybe about nine years old at the time. And I make my way up to look at this Batman poster. And here I am, this little kid in the middle of drug riddled, you know, I guess that was Queens at the time. And the firemen took me, seeing that I was alone, and then they sent me to the police. And so I knew at three years old to only give so much information to the police for risk of what would happen to me and what would happen to my mother and what would happen to my brother and what would happen to my sister, okay? From there, by the age of six, um, I was beginning to be inducted into the spiritual system of my culture. So there was an awareness that I had that was quite far beyond 
someone who was the age of six at that time. I was already preaching. Um, and by the age of 11, I was ordained. So I was being initi initiated from as young as six. I was ordained by the time I was 11 years old. And in that span of 11 to 18, daily in going to school, I was locked inside of a train station uh, side office vestibule, interrogated, uh, threatened, uh, verbally attacked. And it would take the intervention of white underworld people to get the police to leave me alone. Now, mind you, from the age of 11 through 18, I already had a full beard. I looked like a man. But beyond the point of you have my ID, you have the facts, you've already called my school, you've already called the parent, you know, the parent, I assumed that my death would come at the age of 15. I expected to be dead by 15. By the time that I got to 15, I expected to be dead at 21. By the time I was 21, I expected to be dead at 25. Not because I was some criminal, but because my circumstances within this American system that made it clear to me that the most powerful thing in my life was governance, not God, but cops with dogs. Do you understand what I'm saying? So to think that in the company of my Black friends who are ex-military, and they look at me and they engage me and they let me know, they're like, yo, read, like, you got PTSD. And there's nothing for me to deny because the environment in which I grew up in as a Black American is in line with that experience. What experiences that one can have on earth, or even outside of the ghetto, that same violent energy is brought to you, is brought to you <laughs> at the check cashing spot, is brought to you at the arrest, is brought to your body, is carried by six. What's the, the old saying, right? I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. And that may sound very macabre. It may sound dark. It may sound frightening, but this is the reality that now, and not just now, because the reality of uh, immigration of continental African peoples into the United States has, has been ongoing for as long as African-Americans have been here, um, post, post um, uh, the enslavement of our people. So whoever comes into America as an African, as an Aboriginal, Australian, as a Dravidian, as if your skin is like mine, you will be positioned and propositioned to lose faith in your God and to gain some wherewithal of your government. Because how you are governed in the United States is life and death. And um, in coming to a close in, in, in this point, In the course of COVID and what is the middle of a very significant gang war in, in my community right now, I've lost more than 
10 people within the past within the past three months. My neighborhood of East New York in of itself is so laden with all of the isms and issues that plague the United States that between COVID and violence in our community, I've seen whole families from the, the 60 year old mother to the 34 year old daughter to the 35 year old son to the two year old child. And so if we talk about violence, what does it matter if the violence comes from when you're black and you go into the hospital and you don't receive the appropriate care because you have COVID, because they shove a tube down your throat with an inexperienced or a racist nurse, and God bless the many of nurses and doctors who look like me in my community, many who themselves are dealing with the PTSD of just COVID alone, separate of, you know, the warlike violence and weapons that exist in my community. When I think of George Floyd, I just come back to all those different points in my life of how do I celebrate? How do I still tap into my black boy joy? my black man joy, you know, how do I tap into my peace? How do I take that energy and manifest it into the positive relationships that I have with black women? How do I not harm myself and then looking at our community of women who are also an extension of myself? Because how we treat others is as a reflection on who we are. I do that work. I invest in that work. I believe that our culture um, has done a lot to try to invest in, in that work, but we haven't done enough. You know, it's we're 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 lacking the resources through the physical impalement on a system that has so many resources to do us harm. And um, I'm not without hope. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just very active to be present in a space like this to, you know, if it's right now to eulogize um, George Floyd, it's for me to really make it plain. It's for me to tell it like it is. That's really it. And I think that's how we get better. You know, when there was an earlier point brought up of there comes to a point where you can only communicate through anger. And if that's where we're at, you know, at least we're still communicating. But our violence is going to bring forth our annihilation because it's aimed at the wrong conception or idea of the enemy. And that's the nature of the oppression we're going through, to convince us that we are the greatest enemy to each other. And we we are significant. If we're not focused on the those who are truly doing us harm and we're doing harm to each other, then we are practicing white supremacy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Reed. Um, just a quick thing. Um, could you adjust your microphone a little bit, just we, so that we check? Um, my microphone is fine. What it is is that I'm I'm presently in my music studio, okay. and so there's a lot of a lot of bass vibration coming into my studio. Because in right towards the end, the sound changed. So we could hear you so well at the beginning, and then towards the end, it just didn't sound right, but we could hear you still. Okay. 
um, just for um, maybe just a small adjustment for when we have questions later okay. on. Yes, but thank you so much. Those were like really powerful words um, about tapping into our peace and really understanding how power works, how government wants to place itself as God, G-O-V versus G-O-D. And it's something that as black people, we need to kind of understand how power, is, how power works and the amount of power over us that governments and those in power have. And over, um, Diko, would you like to take over? Thank you so much, Tomu, for the good work. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Reed. And uh, I just, I'm so, so burning to come back to the question session. So, <laughs> but but I, will, I will have my questions here later. So I will have to, as, as agreed, to introduce my friend, um, I was trying to. Uh, um, I have to introduce Mr. Ife Paul Azino, who is, I think, with us now. I checked the other time he was with us, and I think he's still with us. Ife Paul Azino is one of Nigeria's best known performance artists and poets. Uh, in 2015, he co founded West Africa's first international poetry festival, the Lagos International Poetry Festival, which he currently directs. He's also the director of poetry at the annual Lagos Book and Art Festival, and is the producer of the spoken word poetry theater production called uh, Finding Home, a production that explores the question of identity, displacement, and African uh, international migration. Uh, in 2017, he was named as one of the most powerful people in the Nigerian art and culture space, uh, space by Y Niger. He published his first collection of poetry in 2015, which is titled uh, For Broken Men Who Cross Often, which is uh, under Parapina Books. He has appeared at the Berlin Poetry Festival, uh, uh, Johannesburg at uh, Alive Festival, Shpia International Poetry Festival, Cape Town, Taipei Inter uh, Poetry Festival, and the IK Book and Arts Festival, among others. Uh, Mr. Azino, um, uh, his poems have been translated into many languages, including Afrikaans, French, German, and Mandarin. He's an Osua Poetry Residency Fellow, and uh, his uh, poetry collection, uh, titled The Tragedy of Falling with Laughter Stuck in Your Throat, uh, came out in 2018. So, I mean, he's uh, sort of, I mean, one of this vast uh, writers, so we got, we are going to have. I mean, he's coming back for the second time. He was with us uh, just a moment ago. So please, Mr. Azino, can you take over? Um, thank you, thank you very much, Diko, for your kind introduction. I think um, what is evident is that I need to edit my bio and make it a lot shorter. Um, I think my brief is to read a poem, and I'm going to do, and I'm going to do just that. In the wave of the, in the course of the wave of protests that attended the killing of George Floyd, I have been preoccupied with um, what Angela Davis calls black radical unity, need for black radical unity, and urgent need for black solidarity um, across the African continent and the black diaspora. And I think indeed we are at a time where we can no longer afford the convenience of this unity, as it were. Um, it's heartbreaking to see what is happening um, in America, um, what is happening also in Britain, and more heartbreaking to see that, you know, what is happening in Africa and across the continent, um, though slightly different in terms of um, the racial dynamic, but when it comes to freedom, economic freedom, and even political freedom to a large extent, the African continent is still not free. And I think we face common challenges, you know, across the world and as black people. And um, we are at a point of global reckoning. And I do believe that um, we need to reclaim our sense of identity. We need to reclaim our sense of dignity 
you know, and particularly on the African continent. Um, we come from dust and fire, a civilization dancing on water and washing its hands in oil. Our technology once commanded ground us to the skies, heaven blessing our offerings in a thousand tongues. We are a nation conceived in promise, a dazzling rainbow created by the currents of the ninja, the stories of poets and the trumpets of rebels. Our greatness has never been in doubt, and we still know how to call wetness from drought. Travel the length and breadth of a continent and you'll see us. Our mothers staring down terrorists in Nigeria, our fathers rebuilding dreams from the mutters of hope. You will find us in Ghana planting for the future. Our songs have traveled from the lips of Joss to the hips of the world. Our women reversing single stories are writing us back into history. It'll be a mistake to ignore us. The ideas of our young people taking flight in Lagos on the wings of technology, connecting the false hopes of yesterday to a cloud of dreams in ones and zeros, a graffiti of new beginnings eclipsing the old. We who built the first largest film industry in the world from tales by moonlight, imagine what we have done. The lifeboats of survival we have spun from our treadbare existence, creative hubs in Ghana, made in Nigeria ambitious in Abba. Imagine what we do. We who invent new worlds in Europe and spread knowledge from America to Canada, doctors and engineers, athletes and artists conquering the world in every sphere. Imagine what we can do here with the leadership invested in calling the magic of our dreams to life. Inventors on the streets of Cape Town waiting to be let loose. Thought leaders expiring in the creeks of the Ninja Delta because we haven't done enough. Imagine how many more Nobel Prize winners we still have in the belly of our struggles. So tell them when they come. But our ideas have no tribe. Our visions are agnostic and our women carry more than babies on their backs. Fumilayo ransom kuti type warriors, they nurse empires at their breasts. Tell them when they ask that long after the oil wells run dry, we'll still be resilient with hope. Lungs filled with possibilities, waiting to breathe a new nation into being. Give us the right tools and watch us build a continent made of stardust and gold. We are stardust and gold, and we come from every tribe, daring you to believe in the audacity of our dreams. Thank you. Thank you so very much for this rendition. And then uh, it is really, really moving uh, with so much uh, images there. And uh, uh, sorry, we, I don't want to take much time talking about this since because I want to come back and ask you a question. So Tomu, um, can we start by putting this first question sent from YouTube uh, to either uh, Dr. Nyek or Mr. Reed? Yes, sure, you can start. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, it's, I think, a question, and then... I thought it was you, because the person has your name on YouTube. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> really, yeah, a big one. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Um, can you see them? Because, okay, I have them. Um, one of the questions was... Um, yeah, it's all right. Is, oh, you have it? Yeah, yeah it said, uh, uh, it's, I think any one of you can, can start. It says, um, is America really land of the free? Do African-Americans need to do more by way of challenging the ideal of Western sort of, I mean, Western democracy in quotation marks that hasn't done much to address this racism or other? So I don't, I mean, any one of you, either Mr. Reed or Dr. Nye. Reed, why don't you go first? Okay, Mr. Reed. Yes, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to hear you clearly. Uh, was that a question you just asked? Yeah, it is a question. It says, is America really land of the free? And then the question continues. Do African Americans need to do more by way of challenging the ideal of Western 
democracy that hasn't yes. done much to address racism or othering? So that is the question. Yes, yes, I saw this question in the chat and it's, um, you see, the, the military aspect of the oppression of a people is one in which they don't really comprehend that the full resources of the state happen to be oppressing them. And I'm saying that from the view, be it of an outsider or to some degree of denial to yourself. But that's the reality. We were having a discussion earlier about, um, you know, like how text can intersect with, with one's life experience. And what I brought up was all these things are written into law. And what are we getting right now in the United States? You have African Americans, be they first generation, second generation, et cetera, et cetera are saying, listen, we want these police officers arrested for killing multiple upon multiple upon multiple black people. And what do they give us? They give us the symbols of a police officer being kneeling down when that symbol is in line with a man who was killed. That symbol is in line with a black man who kneeled to say, listen, I make millions of dollars, but those millions of dollars aren't more important than confronting police brutality and the killing of black men, women, etc. And he lost his job. All right. On top of that, they then paint Black Lives Matter on the floor and cars just run over it. So on one end, it's like, oh yeah, the performative aspects of, lim of liberation without liberation is not liberation. Giving me new chains is not taking the chains off. <laughs> you know, so you have to understand that it's that burden, it's that weight. And are African Americans doing many things to resist that oppression? Very much so. And that teleology goes all the way back to to Walker goes all the way to, you know, Pan-Africanist moves. It, we, this is a, a, a historical resistance. You know, they're not going. That, you know, so that's that's how, how I look at that. Um, as more as we're doing more things to unite between the continent and the United States, may that the world is becoming smaller because there are cameras that show everything that's going on. You know, there there are there are continued continued moral victories that are increasing the 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 angst that's happening all over the world. Um, maybe just to continue with Mr. Reed. Um, there was a question directed to you from YouTube, and it's from Oliver Nyambi. He says, listening to Mr. Reed today is like reading James Baldwin's The, ne the Fire Next Time. Um, and he's wondering if Mr. Reed has stocked any firecrackers for tomorrow, the 4th of <laughs> July. <laughs> um, definitely not. No. There's, there is no celebration for me of the 4th of July, not even so much at a ideolo in an ideological sense, um, because there is a, a very long history of African peoples who were in the condition of slavery celebrating the point in which white people look the other way. So we can talk about so many forms of carnivals. We can talk about so many forms of, you know, celebrating the end of enslavement. When a white person comes to me and says, happy Juneteenth, I'm like, does a person who's been raped want 
someone who's raped them to walk to them and say, hey, I'm done raping. It, 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 it's, it's offensive. And it shows you the, it's disgusting. It shows you the extent to which we're oppressed that the celebration of the taking off chains is not for the jubilation of the individual who is freed. It has become profitable to the individuals who enslaved us in the first place. And so when we talk about July 4th, I can go into the history of Black people serving this country, in serving its freedoms, in serving mm -hmm. its ideals and views of wealth, which have fallen flat on their face. On the other end, I'm going to pay attention to my elders who are going to enjoy the company of family. But for me, I'm in East New York, Brooklyn. New York City is being gentrified. Many of us don't have family members remaining in New York City. Many are in the South. I'm the last member of my family in New York City. So my celebration is most likely going to be in the company of some of my Afro-Brazilian brothers my and sisters in Newark, in an area of the Ironbound, enjoying some churrasco if possible, some samba for certain, some photo, a whole lot of blackness. <laughs> I'll be yeah. swimming in black people. Yes, you know, we have to uh, create our own history, people. our own celebrations. Correct. Correct. Um, this is a question for Dr. Nyek. Um, just to bring in your own lived experiences. Um, from, I'll assume, the stereotypical dreams as an African wanting to travel to the U.S., and now being there where the supposed American dream is available to all those who work hard. As an African now living in the US, have your dreams changed? Um, thank you for that uh, question. I think um, perhaps generally speaking, we want to see all Africans in the US as having a dream or came because they had a particular dream. Um, one of the things that really fascinated me about the US, and I've told this story in different circles uh, many times, um, it was not the wealth. I was, I knew, Afri I knew the United States through reading and reading African-American uh, writers. In fact, that was my incentive to learn English uh, since I grew up in a majoritarily Francophone um, country. So the, the, the fascination was not about things that, you know, people expect the way that question is framed. I had no dream uh, per se, um, but there was this idea of a people a struggle and justice. The difference between perhaps my uh, native country, Cameroon, and the United States, when I was still living there, was that I knew that in the US, you can voice your opinion and be shot for it, and be killed for it. But at least you would have voiced that. And I felt growing up in Cameroon that you had to kill your opinion from inside before, you know, and, and that to me was the fundamental, and I can still say that perhaps is the fundamental difference between, um, between countries. So uh, at a personal level, uh, I, I have never idealized the United States, but there is a particular legacy in this country, uh, especially in terms of the experience of uh, African American and the experience of standing up for justice that that resonate with my personality and the kinds of choices that I've made, uh, not only in coming here, but uh, those that I've made while I've been here. Um, I just want to add that when we talk about justice, mm -hmm. we have to remember it must cost you something. It is a risky business. 
and those who like talking the talk, they can be very attractive. But at the end of the day, if we really want to talk about change, we have to be willing to pay whatever price that is ours to pay in order to bend that arc of, of, of history towards justice, as Martin Luther King uh, put it. So it is really never being satisfied with, with one's, uh, one's victories or accomplishments and to understand that we can always go deeper uh, because what we need is transformation. Sometimes politically we can effect change, but transformation is a different moral attitude that, that, that uh, I think from my perspective, um, King was calling us to explore. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Dr. Nix. Uh, I, I have questions, and but I want us to, uh, uh, for example, in the in the among the audience, if there is anyone, I don't want us to be so much dominating. Is there any question? Can someone uh, show themselves if they have a question? Otherwise, I can ask my questions. Okay, um, I I want to start from uh, F.A. Paul Azino. Um, uh, are you close to us? Hello, Paul. I didn't, I didn't see his face. Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, um, I I mean, all these things are connected. From what uh, we had from uh, the concluding uh, uh, talk of Mr. Reed, especially when he was asking, answering this question last one, that um, the the experiences in Africa are sort of related. They have impact on the treatment of blacks elsewhere in the world, and. Um, I, 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 I have this question to ask you, like from our side, how do you think, uh, what do you think we can do to sort of improve the black dignity around the world? And the second question as a poet, I, I am sort of, I study poetry and I have this problem with the word, with the two words, uh, police brutality. I think um, uh, George Owell talked about the politics of the English language very well. I mean, we have to start correcting things from the language. This is not brutality. This is murder. So call it murder. So police murder, I, I don't have to call it police murder. When you slap me, it's a brutality. Mm. Uh, but that is not the same as putting a neck on my, on my. I mean, putting a knee on my neck and mm -hmm. getting me to death. I mean, it, it, no. So I think we have to start from there. What do you think of these two issues? I, will, I, will, I have questions to Mr. Reed and Nyega, but I will have to come back later. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think it's um, uh, um it's there's yeah the, I I think there's an element of truth to the statement that until um Africa is truly free, you know, as a continent, you know, and as a people, um, you know, black people, you know, cannot be truly free, you know, anywhere else, you know, in the world, and um, since the colonial experience, I think it's been it's been um it's 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 been a shit storm to a very large extent for for many African nations who you know years down the line are still struggling you know to find to find their feet um and a lot of work you know is going on you know within the continent in terms of you know young people who um are rising up to the challenge you know, of, um, of the day, as it were. You know, to a very large extent, I think, you know, across Africa, what has happened has been a sense of, um, of state capture, you know, in a way, where it feels that um, um, idealists, progressive, you know, progressives, young people who um, are bringing me with ideas, who've proven themselves, you know, time and again in the private sector, you know, absent any um, considerable government intervention, you know, but still, you know, cannot, um, do not have the wherewithal, do not have the capital as it were, you know, to organize, you know, politically. And I think um, that's where the new, the new frontier is in Africa. 
you know, young people being able to organize themselves, you know, effectively, you know, enough, you know, to, to, um, to be viable politically, you know, because ac across the continents, you see, you know, if you go to, if you, if you come to Lagos or you go to Accra, you know, or Nairobi or Joburg, there's so much happening, you know, across the continent in terms of, you know, what um, young people have been able to build for themselves, you know, out of nothing, you know, and um, the desire has been, how do we translate that to the political space? You know, because until we are able to do that, what we are going to have as um, young people who have access to education, young people who have um, some level of privilege, you know, and who are able to to um, surmount the, the economic challenges, you know, of their environment and prevail, you know. But what that does is that is that excludes, you know, millions and millions of other young people who do not have that access. You know, and the only way for us to have, you know, that sort of inclusion, you know, has to be politically, you know, and I think, you know, that's where the battle is and we're pushing and, um, mm -hmm. and we're conscious. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, um, what has also been very disheartening to see, a, a couple of days ago, I, I stumbled, you know, on um, one of these, one of these um, contentions you see, you know, time and again um, between... Um, either black South Africans versus, you know, black Nigerians. And then you have this thing with African Americans, you know, and also Africans, you know, and the, and the, 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 the disunity, you know, that you have there. And I think it's something that we, we also have, you know, to build bridges along those lines as well. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I, I am pleased to read, and uh, Mr. Reed and uh, uh, Nye, maybe I start with Dr. Uh, Mr. Reed. You talked about, I think what I see in your own experience is the issue of systemic racism, that it is embedded in the system. It's sort of a trap wherever you go, and it just is sort of trap your futures educationally, economically, socially. I mean, in, you can't escape it. And uh, when we are discussing this issue, um, 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 Prof. Susan keeps saying that this is, I mean, this does not start with Floyd. So no, it has no. to be addressed by the system. Now, what do you think can be done to address the system? Because, I mean, if this continues like that, I mean, yes, this will happen, and then we'll forget, oh, oh, mean, oh mean, it will go away, and then it will have to come back. You can't condition people to be, to be in drugs, to be to be violent, and then when they are violent, when they are in drugs, you see, oh look, you they are in drugs. I mean, we have to start from the condition process to address the system. So, how do you think? I mean, you grew up into the system. How do you think we can we can address it, or it can be addressed anyway? Well, if we talk about um, mm -hmm. the history of African Americans, particularly in ways in which they often floated above. Uh, the oppressive nature nature of the system. A lot of times, it was attached to escape. So, if we talk about the history of, um, you know, my my people were 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 Seminoles. You know, uh, many of my friends, uh, their peoples, you know, were. Uh, what you call uh, uh, quilombolas. They, these, these are individuals who have a history of maroon culture, of leaving, escaping the plantation and deciding that they're going to make a, a place for themselves. So you have histories of free, free Blacks. You have histories of, again, I bring up the maroons, you know, Aboriginal Americans. Um, and then post that, you have the onset of war and African Americans traveling, leaving to Europe, having different experiences that augmented the perception of how this system works, right? Not because there isn't a version of it in France, not because there isn't a version of it in Martinique or 
it exists in these other places because it's an entire program. But being able to have a different vantage point of it causes you to say, kind of like, like Albert, you know, Kamu, you're, you're, you're like, this is, I'm a stranger here. Like, none of this makes any sense. And we have to tap, continue tapping away into all of those soft spaces, parts of the system. And I found in my life, I mean, by the time I was 20, 21, was when I first made it to Africa, you know, and I came to Ghana, West Africa, and that journey in going to school at Legon altered my life path because I got to see black African men in a different way. And this was before I even met my own father. And it didn't come from idealism. It came from a Muslim brother named Mamuni who said, Reed, I want you to see the highs and lows of Ghana. I want you to see the problems. I want you to enjoy the simple pleasures. I want you to see the manipulation. I want you to have clarity about that Africa isn't to be placed in an ideal. It's to be recognized as real. You know, and here you are in Ghana. This is only one part of it. Keep going. And that inspired my journey within the United States of there were soft parts of the matrix to break through. You know, and then connecting with like minded people, I first became connected with Big Sauce um, through collaboration with another, you know, African American artist. And he came from a very different world than I came from in terms of class dynamics. You know, there is the aspect of being an educated black man, and then there's the aspect of being a classified black man, right, who has a certain class that along with their intelligence provides them a consistency of access that I only gain by using the internet, not because my father was necessarily around, not because my mother was around, you know, there was access to information that was as consistent to me as a library book as the development of the internet. It was always there for me to know. And everyone doesn't have the, the willingness to travel in that direction because you're, you're, you're trying to eat and not just trying to eat in the context of the consumption of food, but people hold other black people hold you accountable to the system that oppresses them. And so black women can experience that within a relationship, right? Uh, where the most intimate partner is part of like the oppressive system is inside your house every day, you know? And it may be experienced in other ways, you know, for us, as black men as well, or whatever your gender dynamic may be, etc. So I, you know, coming back to, to the point, I feel, I feel that there is a great power in us coming together like this, you know, and black people have a way of making space in the face of those who are even in their space. You know, we have an ability to code switch. We have an ability to get shit done in the midst of Pro. you know, in the midst of the financing of our movements may come from white dollars, et cetera. But we have to be completely and fully committed to to that coercion, to that, uh, I mean, to that, that subterfuge, to that side of it and outside, you know, because on one end, there's a history of talking about the, the house Negro, but, but the so-called house Negro 
being the first one to let those in the field know what the master is doing and leading or pushing forward a rebellion. So we have to say, all right, Black people are in different spaces, be it through class, be it through gender, be it through perspective and travel and finance. We need to be supporting each other. If I may ask um, Ada just two things is that, yes, uh, there are African Americans in the United States, but it is the African part that is hated. It's not the American part of that equation. So even as we're talking about race, let us just remember that we know race doesn't exist and that the, the line is always change, changing. You know, today we might decide that the Irish are not white and then, you know, we'll push them on this side. That is how it works in this country. But the point is the following one. We cannot ask what African Americans are doing or have done. The point is blackness and racism linked to blackness reflect one and one thing as far as I'm concerned. It is anxiety that the place called Africa produces in Western and world imaginary. When we understand that, then this is about all of us. There will be no way where Africa will rise and be respected as long as African Americans are humiliated and killed like dogs in the street. There will be no day when the reverse will also be true. Because however hard we try, some people will say I disconnect from Africa, whatever, whatever are the issues there, the point remains that it is the link to that continent that is the problem. If they were taken from, if the, the, the enslaved people were taken from Europe, in fact, they have been indentured mm -hmm. servants from Europe for those who know the history to penal colonies. So when you were uh, 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 kind of left, left uh, to rot in Europe, they, were, they would bring you to the United States, to Louisiana, to settle, et cetera, et cetera. Why is it that those people, the conditions are not the same, don't get me wrong. But why is it that to some extent we can trace, you know, kind of similarities of people coming to the United States as unfree people, but why is it that they have sort of managed, you know, to, 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 to be integrated and in Europe and the U.S. today, even if we can say England used to hold uh, the U.S. as a colony, the relationships are very friendly. After World War I, and Europeans destroyed, whatever. Who, who decides to rebuild Europe from the rubbles? The Marshall Plan. So when, when it comes to, we are actually gonna protect the interests of where we come from. It happens because that is a natural default. So let us not be caught, be caught up into this kind of race, race thing because the reality is that race doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is the continent of Africa. And it doesn't matter whether you speak English with an accent or you don't have an accent, whether you are an African with a PhD or you don't have it, whether you are a, a, a criminal or not, you are an African. It is the word Africa that bothers people in this world and we have to say it as it is. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nyek. I think we are running out of time, but. I mean, you can see the power and, and it's really enjoying and more people are coming in, uh, but we have to stop because, I mean, we really just, have to stop just a because, moment, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, I think I just want to return quickly to um, the topic of discussion, seeing this as a memorial to George Floyd and what interventions we can contribute to. Um, one of the comments from Facebook from Sola Olorunyomi, he was agreeing and complimenting Mr. Reed's observation that when you said that you'd like to think that the African American resistance commenced right from that moment of slavery and the invasion of their land on the African continent. 
And then Dr. Nyek, you mentioned um, looking at Dr. Martin Luther King's strategies. And then also the deco from YouTube, he mentioned, he asks, um, maybe African-Americans need to be more like Malcolm X. So in conclusion, um, with what's happening with um, where people, um, like depends which media you're watching, how they turn demonstrations or forms of resistance into rioting, um, how that story just gets um, turned over into a bad situation. What are your reactions and what interventions um, would you propose? Is that to both of us? Yes, sure. Oh, to the three of you. It wasn't great. <laughs> to the three of you, as your closing words, seeing okay. it as the memorial on Instagram. Well, yeah. well, I mean, from from the African American perspective, um, something that is just so consistent is 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 dissent. What happens is you have a history of, you know, black people through coercion, selling each other out in movements. And the saddest part of the story of Malcolm is there is the aspect where we see Malcolm as the alternative to Martin. And then there's the aspect of where we see Malcolm become more of a of a of a of a, of a centrist figure where he he moves more to the middle right and more towards almost a humanist concept and the problem that i have with that telling of of Malcolm is saying well Malcolm is only acceptable if we soften him up and Obviously, we can get into aspects of uh, misogyny when we talk about um, the 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 nature of the of the concept of of leadership and masculinity and things of that sort. Be it in the case of the Nation of Islam or Black revolutionary politics, things of that sort. Um, within that era, um, which definitely have all of their fault. But one thing that I'll say about Malcolm is he came from such a dredge, from such a bottom, and educated himself to be able to pivot through, through learning. And that learning was very much invested in the interest of his people. There's the aspect of that Malcolm loved to learn, but he used that power to the benefit of his community. And when I look at Martin, you then find that Martin didn't move, uh, he moved in a greater direction of what some people would say was extremism, but he just told it like it was. If the oppression is economic, then you need to confront the economics. And if you're gonna send people who are oppressed to fight in a so-called enemy who are also oppressed, then what are we there for? And at that point, they killed him. At the point at which it became viable for Malcolm or Martin to somehow collaborate and work to, together, they were killed. And then the story becomes, someone in their circle sold them out. It's enough of a rumor in the case of, 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 of Martin, and it's very much a fact in the case of Malcolm. So again, I come to the point that Black people, African people, we have to be so invested in our well-being that there is nothing that can get in between our movements and that we should be able to identify who is working against us. OK, uh, Mr. Lee, thank you so much. We have really gone out of our scheduled time. That was a very important question from uh, Shirin. But uh, thank you. I mean, the good thing is that you are in our group. So I think we can take it up there.
But the question is really important. I think we will find time to address it on our WhatsApp group. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Tomu, I think you should close the session and then, I mean, handle it to the next presenters. Oh, okay. Somalia, yes. Somalia is supposed to be the next. Yes. Uh, um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us during this session. Um, there was a question of um, how to follow Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed is available on Facebook at Mr. Reed ENT, Mr. Reed. Is All ENT. social media at Mr. All Reed social. ENT. Yes, yes. <laughs> you've gained a couple of fans here once again. <laughs> <laughs> M-R-R-E-E-E-N-T. Okay, um, thank you everybody and thank you for your input and the questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Nyek. Thank you, thank you. F. Paul Azino. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I didn't ask for F. Paul Azino's um, social media. Would you like to jump in? Um, yes, um, F. Paul Azino on all social media handles. Okay. And Dr. Nyek, would you like more followers on Twitter? It is at uh, Dr. Nyek, at okay. Dr. N. S. N. Nyek. Thank you. 